I'll turn on the recording. And with um, much joy, I would love, like to introduce Dr. Erna Lant as our first speaker this year for the Alberta CCN PLC. Erna has worked, as we were just chatting about, in the field of AAC for many years, um, starting in um, South Africa and then more recently coming to, um, uh, it, not Canada, coming to um, the coming to the United States and doing some work there with Indiana University. Um, I heard Erna talk at uh, ASHA in, in two years ago in, in LA, where she was talking about the work that she was doing on this book, which I love. Um, and I was absolutely smitten by her approach to meaning making and I would say the human side of AAC sort of the privileging of that so um, I am delighted to um, I should also say Erna has a website that has lots of wonderful resources and I did send that out with the link to this and another claim to fame that she has is she was uh, an SLP for Martin Pistorius is am I saying it correctly Erna? Yes, yes. Uh, the, 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 who is um, the ghost boy. And I think many of you have read that book. And so that she's, she's done many war marvelous things and will continue to do so. Um, not the least of which would share some of her thoughts um, and experiences and her perspective with us today. So welcome, Erna. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you, Kathy. It's a real privilege for me to be here to talk to everybody today. Yes, and just to give you a little bit of an update on Martin Pistorius, um, I wasn't his SLP, I was his employer. <laughs> but also, I just recently saw him because I visited um, him. He lives in the UK, in London. And it's just outside of London, actually. You know, they got the, he and Joanna, his wife, got a little baby. So I went to see the baby, and uh, yeah, what great joy. In any case, I, you know, with that, I just wanted to say, you know, very nice to speak to everybody in the beginning of the school year. Um, as some of you might know, I do I work as a consultant in the schools. So I spend my life these days basically going to schools and supporting teachers and therapists in dealing with the kind of challenges that I experience, you know, and um, over the years, I think we've all come to realize that the group of kids that we work with, work with in AAC in particular, really is so diverse and complicated that it's always nice to just have another set of eyes and then to have a sort of collaborative approach to help us solve the pro our problems or at least not necessarily solve them, but find new ways of thinking about it. So that's what I do currently, and I really enjoy it a lot. So I really sympathize and I empathize with people who start in the beginning of a new school year with all the fr frantic activity and getting to know new, um, sorry, I'm gonna just put this off. With new, um, students that one needs to get to know and faculty members, you know, new faculty members that one has to work with in school, not least of all the, the administrative issues that one needs to deal with and, and get to know. And so it's very easy right in the beginning of the year to feel overwhelmed already in the start of a year. And this presentation that I have for you today is really about the core of what really matters. It's about the quality of our interactions with each other and with the clients that we serve. It's not the frequency of the interaction. It's not about how we communicate with the people that we work with. It's also not how much time we spend with the people that we work with. It really is focused on what happens between us when we interact with each other. You know, it's quite possible for one to go through a whole day of interactions. Um, talking to kids, faculty, sharing very little 
in the personal way, getting home and being really burnt out, even in the beginning of the year. And I think it's very important that we reflect on that and ask ourselves, why do we feel like that? Why don't we recharge during the day? Um, and then also to put ourselves in the shoes of the kids and thinking, what does that feel like when they get home? You know, how much did they experience during the day that actually built them and that created that kind of closeness that adds to our lives? So really, if you listen to and you read my book, I think at the, at the really core of the issue here has got to do with gain. It's got to do with how much do we gain when we're together? How much can we actually grow together? How much can we sort of really enjoy together? Because I believe that those things go very closely together. So as my summary said, you know, I'm going to focus on meaning making and really look at two aspects. The one is the importance of participation. If you can't have a means of participation, obviously it's very really difficult. But we traditionally in speech and language pathology has been very good at focusing on participation, getting people to speak, getting people to take turns, um, you know, and lengthening and having sort of extending our interaction with each other. So what I'm really dealing with today is not so much how do we communicate, but what happens. And a pivotal part of that is the role of engagement. In other words, how engaged are we when we actually interact with each other. Um, the reason why this is so important is because that's the basis of friendship. Uh, and, it, you know, uh, the basis of, of peer interaction, which we know is so important in all our lives. So the goal of today is only twofold. The one is, to talk about what matters most, the quality of our interaction with our clients, our colleagues, and our friends. And as I said, as an AAC therapist, obviously my primary concern here is to our, definitely to our clients who use AAC, but it really is relevant much more sort of generally than that. I think coming to, you know, underline this is also really thinking about whether all this frenetic activity and all these, you know, repetition that we do so frequently with our kids, whether all of that really helps us to achieve the goal of getting the kids interested in communicating with us and developing their skill. So doing less oftentimes is more. I, want, I just want to put it out there for you to think about because I think it's a very important part of our reflection when it comes to um, evaluating what we actually contributed to our children's ability to communicate at the end of each year. Meaning making obviously is a very important part, not only to bring people together and create closeness, but it's a vitally important part to encourage me, to entice me, to actually get back and talk to you again. If I don't enjoy my interaction with you, there's nothing meaningful that happens. There's nothing unique between us. Why would I want to go back and talk to you again? And I think we forget that. Even with kids, if there's nothing special happening with you and your interaction with, a, with a, a student, then how can we blame them for not really wanting to enter that relationship or, or that coming for therapy for that matter? So I'm going to talk about what is meaning making. I'm going to talk about how is meaning making different from a traditional way of thinking about communication interventions, speaking and therapy. And then I'm going to talk about the two important concepts of engagement and participation. Okay, so what is meaning making? Meaning making is an approach to intervention that focuses on making sense. Okay, on the sense that we make in interaction between us. Rather than the structure, 
or the modes of communication that we use. So it's really focused on what happens in between us. And a big part of that is uniqueness. Because and we talk about new nuanced meaning. It basically means it's not a radically new meaning. But it's something that developed between us that's got nuances that's new. And therefore makes it special for me to have spoken to you or to interact with you. And then obviously at the bottom of this all is just the quality, the connection, uh, the quality of, of our interaction and being and togetherness with each other. Okay, so to demonstrate this to you, what is new nuanced meaning, I want you to look at this picture. And okay, so this is a lizard. You get it in South Africa. It is what we call a lickabon, but in America you talk about rock monitors. Gets up to six feet long. Um, it is not that, it's not necessarily dangerous or, you know, but it's got a vicious tail. And it normally lives, you know, in trees. It basically mostly sort of would lie on branches, tree branches, tree branches so you wouldn't easily see them. Now, when I show you this picture and I talk to you about this, um, and you walk out of the room, you probably going to say, okay, well, what's this woman? I mean, like, okay, so fine, that was a little barn or a rock monitor, but there's nothing special about it. So you'll probably forget about it the moment you leave the room. However, when I talk to you and I say to you that I recently was in South Africa and I shared three nights in a room with a ligabon like that, then you're gonna go, wow, and you're gonna start looking at that picture again, and you're gonna say, wow, look at that tongue. Why, uh, what's, what happened? Why would this woman stay for three nights with a ligabon or a rock monitor in a room? You know, does she have something to prove or what? So the truth of that story is, I only did it because I wasn't aware that I was doing it. And <coughs> in fact, I heard during the night that there was quite a significant noise in my room. But I was so jet lagged and I was so sort of set on my cousin telling me that now there's, you know, there's nothing that can get into this house, because I was sleeping on the top floor. There's nothing that can enter this house. And as you might, you know, think, I was, I was perfectly willing to be persuaded that that probably is just squirrels or something. But I must say it was a very pronounced noise. And so the next morning I went down the stairs and I said, oh, you know, like, there was this unbelievable noise in my room last night. And she was saying it's impossible because we cleared all, we stopped all the holes, you know. There's no way that animals could come in. So the second night, same thing, third night, same thing. But I was so jet lagged that I actually did turn around and sleep. So once I arrived home, that's when my cousin phoned me and said, hey, but guess what? When you left, we cleaned, you know, we had to clean the house and this is what we discovered. And this was, in fact, you know, the noise that you heard for three nights in a row. Now, after I told you, I shared that with you, you know, you are much more likely when you walk out of the door and you see your little one or you, you see somebody else to say, sure, come look here to show and share what I've in fact shared with you, even though you initially didn't relate to it at all because it's not something you know. And that is, you know, the, the core concept of meaning making. It's about shared experience with another. That does not necessarily add a lot of new information and knowledge, 
but it shares a personal, a personal engagement and experience because now when you look at that uh, rock monitor, you start thinking, what would it be like six, six feet long to sleep with something like that in a room for three nights, not being aware that it is there? So, many making is about experience, the experience that you have with someone, of being close to another. And it's about learning to show interest because now for the first time you're starting to look like, oi, oi, look at that tongue. Gosh, oh, you know. And it's also the experience and of the power of actually other people listening to you. So it's not just a matter of me listening to you, it's also you listening to me. And for kids, an incredibly important uh, experiential um, event. Because that's how friendships get created. So next time when I see you, um, you will most probably remember about this and say, hey, did you do it again or whatever? And that's important because that's an impetus to draw us together to start sort of a conversation again. And so it's not just about instruction. I can instruct you about what is a lizard and what is a lookabon and how it and it's how big it is, etc. And those are sort of relevant information, but it does not really entice me, uh, you know, entice one to actually engage in interaction about it. And this really is the difference between you know, meaning making and interaction. Communication is about meaning. It's about shared meaning. And it's about creating that meaning between us in a situation where it didn't previously exist. So this is what we're after. You know, you've got your AAC user, the communication partner, and in the middle is meaning making. And meaning making is about not able, only the ability to communicate sort of using speech Speech, um, speech output device, um, gestures, but also about engagement. And this is what was the level of personal involvement that you and I shared when we actually interacted with each other. So I'm going to show you this video of a, of a grandfather and his grandchild. I want you to listen very carefully. It's a very short video. And I want you to think about um, what do you think are the main features, most important features of this interaction between this grandfather and his grandchild. Now, I also need to point out that it's taken in a natural situation at home. So there's lots of distractions similar to a classroom context. You were holding a book. Do you want to hold the book? Yeah. Dad, look out! Ray, Ray, stop! No way! What do we got here? Oh my God! Ooh. Yeah. Who's that? Me, the biggest one. That's it. Who's that? Oh, I don't know his name. What's his name? Oh, you were wrong, Ray! Nothing else in here. Is that? See, it has a little trunk. Freddy the fish? It's it's funny, the the, uh, okay, so that's a normal household context with lots of competing noise. In spite of the context though, I think for me what's most striking here is the social closeness between the father, the granddad and his granddaughter. And the fact that they're able to have shared attention within a context that's actually quite demanding and very distracting. And I think for me that's incredibly encouraging because that's how kids learn. Very seldom do we find ourselves in quiet spaces where you can sort of focus on each other. Much more likely that we need to create the interest to actually draw each other together in order to start communicating. But it's the focused interest that I think really is of great importance here is just the way in which the granddad talks to his grandchild 
and the little one looking away but actually being incredibly interested in what the grandfather had to say. So this joint attention and this triadic um, attention because it's between the book and the granddaughter and the father and the granddad. So it's not just this kind of interaction. It's really talking about what is in the immediate environment. The other thing I think that's really quite clear here is the slow pace of the interaction to give time to see each other. Quite a bit of time here is, is taken by the grandfather to actually look at um, his granddaughter, to, to watch what she's doing. And a lot of watching is done also from the granddaughter in terms of watching her granddad. And for meaning making, these are probably some of the most pivotal pointers for us is how keen are we to observe each other in the interaction? The final observation I want to make here is one of playfulness. The grandfather was reading this book and he was saying, okay, who is this? And she was obviously not going to respond. I don't think she, perhaps she knew, perhaps she didn't. But then he started throwing out ideas. Is this Freddy the fish? And this was not Freddy the fish. And she responded, oh yes. And he went with it because there was this playfulness that was between the two of them. That is very typical of meaning making. The openness of, hmm, what are you saying here? I know it's not Freddy the fish, but say hey. Yes, for us it's really the fish. Because that is the uniqueness in the, how the uniqueness in this interaction actually is allowed to develop. Something that did not exist before. I think sometimes we are so set on what it is accurate and what isn't that we miss out on, but does it really matter in this interaction? Because in order to allow for the development of meaning, there has to be openness in order to allow for the development of new nuanced meaning. So meaning making is not just a cognitive affair. I think that's a very important point to remember. It's not about understanding. It's, you cannot equate meaning making with cognitive understanding because it also includes a very important component of emotional resonance. That means the ability to just zoom in and be with someone where they are at, not where you think they should be. Um, and this is particularly important, you know, in all communications, but particularly with AAC users, because it's so easy to just impose your own position on a, a student who can't, cannot speak, that the art is really not to do that. In order to get to know the individual, in order to interest him in what you have to offer, so that you can really expand his ability to communicate in a meaningful way. So this is just a, a meme that I thought actually that struck me that I want to share with you if I can get to it. Okay, so that's Freud saying, I'd rather people feel it all before understanding it. And I think it's true for a lot of interactions. When you enter interaction with a kid, before you actually start interacting with a student, if we can ask ourselves, um, What, what does this child feel like before? Actually, so sorry, I need to get this back up. Okay, so meaning making, what is it? Meaning making is about sense making. It's about understanding the self and other 
in an interaction. And as I said, it's not just perspective taking. You know, with um, theory of mind, with children with autism, etc., we become very oriented towards perspective taking, taking the role of the other. And quite honestly, we know it's important. We know that it's important for empathetic interactions, but it's not all it is. Empathy is a lot more than that. And being able to develop meaning certainly is a lot more than perspective taking. It's about an intersubjective process that involves emotional resonance, effective congruence between people, so that in fact it ties us together to develop something that would be unique between us. So when I talk about meaning making, I'm talking about engagement, but I, part of engagement is a very important part is not only perspective taking, because it's also the personal involvement which happens, the intersubjective nature of that interaction. So why is meaning making important? It's the basis of our relationship with others. It's the ability to not just share messages, but construct messages together and to build something in between us that didn't exist before. The need for this in our schools is tremendous. You know, there's a lot of, quite a few reports that came out very recently, looking at the social emotional benchmarks of students and where we should focus on uh, really looking at the isolation of children that leads to depression and all, you know, the different kind of behavioral issues that we have. So I really think it's a really critical issue for us to look at is how do we go about facilitating um, meaning making and interactions between peers. And it starts with making sure that we give kids the kind of experience of what meaning making really is about. And it starts with our interaction with these students, our interaction with the parents, so that we can move towards an experiential approach rather than do this, do this, do this, do this, which is an instructive type of approach. Communication is not about instruction, it's about experiencing being with people. Okay, so there's also this, you know, couple of articles recently on well-being, and um, I'm going to read this to you because I found it very touching. It was about William Rawlings, who's a communication professor, that said, um, said to his students, basically, the second paragraph here, Pay close attention to the habits that you form. Uh, because before you know it, you could have organized yourself in a way that doesn't allow for the kinds of friends that you really would like to have. And he really talks there about the time that you take to invest in the quality of the attention that you are prepared to invest in people. So three concepts of AAC focused meaning making is then really the issue of participation, engagement, the fact that there needs to be personal engagement for meaning to develop. Otherwise you can share, you can exchange, you can share exchanges, you can, you can share information, but you do not develop meaning in a way that something happens between you. And the third concept here that's very important is the creative interaction between participation and engagement, because it's not a 50-50. You know, um, engagement and participation is a synthesis, is a way sometimes a person can participate a lot and not communicate at all, like they can talk a lot. Sometimes somebody can talk very little, but can make some very significant nonverbal cues to keep meaning development at actually quite a high level. In fact, you sometimes find this in um, <clears throat> situations with um, adults that lose their like motor neuron disease, um, ALS, where people lose the ability, but they still sort of really in tune with each other. But they can develop quite quite a significant level of meaning between them, even though you know the participation of one person could be quite limited. <clears throat> okay, so participation 
is something we're very familiar with. It's the ability to exchange messages, to share with another. Um, and that obviously requires an expressive ability, making sure that the individual has a means to communicate, has a speech generating device. But as I talked earlier to Cathy, um, it really is the beginning of it. It's not, it's the beginning of the process of actually getting somebody to engage in communication. The real challenge is how to engage the speech generating device and helping the person develop authentic communication with other people. <clears throat> Participation very often manifests in our, you know, in our interactions with students is the ability to do with others and to reach goals, to participate in our goals for the classroom, in teaching, literacy, and you know, all these trials that we do with students, that's participation. It's based on stimulant response. We want the kid to learn certain things and understand me well, I do think there's a place for that. I think what, I, what we're becoming increasingly concerned with is that we do this 80, 90% of the day of this child's day at school and the child actually gets very little exposure to what really matters for the rest of his life and really impacts his learning quite significantly. And that's his ability or his or her ability to really engage in meaningful interaction with other people. Engagement then is the ability to be attentive to and respecting of others in an interaction. It's interest in others. Um, it's the ability to take perspective and it's emotional resonance. The ability to sort of just zoom in and be with that person to, to get an idea of where that person is at today. And sometimes, you know, you can enter a classroom and immediately get some sense of what's going on in the classroom. I think that's incredibly important. The same you do when you actually start interacting with one of your students. It is this intersubjective component that enables communication partners to listen to each other and really develop meaning between them. So, as I said before, it's this creative synthesis between engagement and participation that is really what is important. And this is how we think about it. So, you have participation on the one sort of um, axis and engagement on the other. And then we can look at students who have very high participation but very low engagement. Those are the, your talkers, people who kids who can regurgitate a lot of information but actually having great difficulty actually engaging with it at all. You also have low participation, low engagement, where students would be very passive and really not do anything. They're not interested, but they also don't participate. And on the other side, you would have high participation, high engagement, where the student is not necessarily talking all the time, but he participates in a very appropriate way because he's engaged and he's able to sort of with a high level of engagement participate. So his participation in that context is optimal. I think what's important here is that frequency of participation is not what this is about. It's part of it. But the most important thing is also to look at the pro appropriacy of the interaction that, of the participation that, that the person actually displays. And then we have low participation, high engagement. This is a situation where AAC users could be, because they, they might not have the ability to participate, but they might be, although that's not often the case, very high in engagement. Somebody like Martin Pistorius might have sort of been in this category when he actually came out of the coal mine, started to be actually very aware uh, of what happens, you know, around him. So this is really how we look at it from an assessment point of view and then the issue, obviously, and, and just helping us to understand where on the spectrum 
can we start sort of placing this job in, or this person in terms of meaning making? So we have engagement, participation, and in the, in the middle there, the development of new nuanced meaning. How do the participation, uh, the participation of this individual and his ability or her ability to engage work together to actually sort of entice the development of meaning making between people? Okay, so when you ask me about new nuanced meaning, I'm saying that's what's unique in an interaction. And that doesn't mean to say that in every interaction that you have with somebody, you're going to talk about a lizard or, you know, anything that extreme. No, it can be something very short and very sort of common, but it's just a different nuance to it. You interact with somebody and they put a spin on something that makes you smile. And that's the beginning of it, because that's something that didn't exist when you walked in before. And a very impoverished version of that is me coming in saying, hello, how are you? Oh, I'm fine, thank you. It's a nice day, yes, it's very nice. I mean, like the ritual type of interactions that has, that's devoid of any personal, um, of any level of engagement, really. So this is just to show you that there is depth to this approach because the idea really is that you have different levels of meaning and that these levels are not just cognitive, although obviously the cognitive plays a significant role, but there's a very significant awareness of the level of emotional resonance and being with an individual. And it becomes increasing and very important when with young kids, like for example, the video you saw, with children who don't necessarily have the ability to express themselves. And we find the same also with AAC users. Okay, so the first level is formalistic meaning, where everything is formalistic, it's the rituals, we're very good at it. It's very, it is possible to go through a day's work at school really never moving beyond formalistic level one and two. The downside of that is you get home incredibly tired because nothing really made sense to you. I mean, there was never, nothing really that talked to you during the day. So level two is literal meaning as we're here now focused. Um, the, you have exchanges, but the exchanges are basically information sharing mostly. Uh, nothing really any more, in, you know, much more depth in terms of personal involvement. Level three, level four start with extended meaning where you can see there's also a more definite understanding on emotive level when in fact there's resonance. They look at each other. Uh, and then also they're able to, to take that understanding that they get from the attention and bring it into the interaction so that the meaning that is developed is actually quite unique and, you know, engaging for both people. And the last level four <clears throat> is versatile meaning, which is a very deep level of meaning that could be um, reached regardless. It's not easy to, but you can reach that level of, of interpersonal meaning when you, even though you don't have a lot of expressive ability. And that is very important because for me, the basis of looking at the different levels of meaning is to sensitize us to the fact that the ability to not speak or to not express yourself in any, whatever the reason might be, should be an impetus for us to delve into engagement with that individual in order to sort of really get a reliable uh, impression of what that person can do. And this really is what the field of AAC is all about. So you can mean, you can, you can measure the level of meaning making. Um, I'm not going to go into any level of detail on this. Uh, some of it's in my book. Those of you who are interested are welcome 
to contact me, but this I think is a topic for another day. Um, and there's a scale, a meaning making scale where we start looking at how do you really uh, describe participation and engagement in order to plot it on that, you know, to plot it and get some better idea of how we're progressing. But finally, I just want to talk a little bit about what does this add? What does a meaning making approach add to existing intervention efforts? You know, first of all, it's a move away from a focus on strategies. Uh, it's not just about strategies. We have to know about strategies. But really what is important is how do we infuse the strategies that we use into into the existing sort of um, experience of meaning making. The problem with uh, not doing it that way is that we use strategies, we teach skills, we come back, we teach them again. Every time when there's a break, there's no carryover, there's very little sustainability. And I think we really need to understand that if we keep on imposing structures in a teaching way on people it, it really does not encourage them to become to personally get involved and actually use what we're teaching so meaning making is a start a little bit from a different angle it starts with personal involvement and how do i draw that kid in to start sort of showing interest it's a focus on inter intersubjective process of meaning making, self other awareness, which we haven't spoken about, is critical. Importance of observation and listening to the other, being present to the other. You know, there need to be an openness to each other in order to allow for that growth. Like that grandfather did, you know, the, it wasn't the response that he wanted or that he thought was accurate, but you know, he was able to take that response from the little one and build on it to expand this experience of togetherness, which is so important for that kid to actually experience because that is what's going to bring the little granddaughter back to the grandfather, the fact that she had fun with him. And as I said, the, the importance of effective, the effective dimension it's not just about cognition. Okay, so there's a couple of references. I mean, basically the references that I used, but you're welcome to go onto my website. There might be some more stuff there that might be of interest to those who really related to what I have to say. So thank you very much. It's lovely talking to you. Oh, Erna. <laughs> um. Thank you. I, um, I, I can't help but, well, oh, there's so many things. I, I, but I, I can't help to, to bring it to an experience that I had today when someone was saying, how do I help this child who clearly can understand, but who doesn't want to use the system? And I think the whole emphasis has been on shall i just put it this way the accents on the wrong syllable instead of being open to what the child wants to say to be listening to all of the beautiful things that you've said today we have been so intent on um output wow. output as opposed to outcomes and an outcome which could be truly coming into um, engagement and coming to a place of meaning making with children who may or may not have devices is I think the the essence of our work and um, I am so grateful for your talk today to start us off um, this this term and this year and um, I also can't help but think um, and I, I, I'm, I'm cautious here because one of the things that came to me is if we could use, if we could put your levels in our IPPs <laughs> instead of some of the ways that we think about measuring outcomes, um, what a potent, what potential difference it would have 
for children. And actually, and I, something that you said is really important, I think, to the level of, um, so that we wouldn't come home exhausted because we exactly. haven't engaged in meaning making with our, our students. We have been doing something else that is not giving us energy, it's yeah. sucking more energy. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yes, I, mm, I'm so glad. <laughs> I'm so glad that I asked you to, to I'm talk. Glad, Kathy. And you know what? The kind of things that you're saying about your experience today is incredibly important. I was in a class the other day, we were starting with an, you know, including a little one in a classroom. And I was struck by the child with autism, and he's nonverbal. But he was interested, you know, and he wasn't going to tell the teacher that because now he's busy here doing his thing. But she was talking and every so often I saw him looking. Yeah. And I was elated because I thought he's in exactly the right class. Mm -hmm. So afterwards when I was talking to the teacher, she was saying to me, he doesn't want to participate, he doesn't, this, he shouldn't be in this class. And I said, hey, hey, you know, let's relook this. No. How do we miss this, even? Right. Um, just to sort of exacerbate, you know, accentuate what you're saying, our prejudice in only wanting to see one way of kids participating, you know? Yes. Um, and it's such a pity because we kill it. We kill it. There it is. I think that's exactly it. We kill it. We make it into work. We make it into something that is the antithesis of what we want it to be. Um, and, and I certainly, meaning make, I, I wrote writing notes, meaning making kids with autism. I've had the opportunity to observe in some classrooms lately where kids um, had autism and you know they had all these devices, but not, that was not what was hooking them. But they, this one child came up to the teacher and did something that I couldn't, I, I wasn't in their relationship well enough to see what happened or to understand. But the next thing you know, the teacher was getting something to rub on this child's back. That's meaning making that, but you know, um, that's not going to hit on anyone's um, checklist. <laughs> Yeah, uh, although, although when the child, if the child responded from that with a very challenging behavioral sort of response, that would have made it. <laughs> it would have made it. It would have made it, yes. <laughs> Honest to goodness, that darn kid just didn't react strongly enough. Yes, um, anyway, so there's just been so many instances in my brain as I have heard you talk today of the critical importance of us um, finding out who these children are and taking the, taking the time and the, and it's, it's, I, I, to, to talk about your idea of either draining or, or seek, it, it's not, it's not work to do that. It doesn't take energy to do that. It actually fills you up when you can, can do it, I think. So I'm, I'm talking a lot. I want to open it up now. Are there any other folks that have comments or questions or thoughts for Erna in the last couple of minutes? You can say them on uh, live or you can put them in the chat. <laughs> well, it's also the end of the day. One understands that people are tired. Yeah. Um, oh, so so from Wendy. So here we go. Um, I love the meaning making. Our system, I think our, that our system makes it so the focus is on output. Yes, absolutely. And, and I think, I mean, for me, um, this approach, this thinking, ha dare I say, has the opportunity to revolutionize the way we come into being with um, our, our children, students, people who communicate in, in a multitude of different ways. Um, and maybe I'm a little bit more attuned because I too have a grandson and I love, you know, but, but 
this is it. Who, um, there's a lovely quote by Michael um, Williams who talks about his grandfather putting him on his knee and trying to figure out who is this child? And I think that's the essence of what you've tried to say. Let's, who is this child and how can I get to know this child rather than get this child to perform for me, which is another thing that one of my lovely, um, not so unopinionated AAC uh, user says, I'm not a trained monkey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right so there's more things coming in um we need to oh <laughs> we need to make insurance companies in the u.s and the administrators get on board it's about the money and the numbers comment about that so yeah. but you know it's also about the challenge here is to develop measuring strategies um for what is not observable and i think that that's possible I think we should just pick up the challenge, you know. Um, small baby steps. We can't start, you know, but I think I think we're moving in that direction because I think the frustration that we've had, for instance, with this, we have to cure autism. And the recent tendency, you know, the recent realization that I've seen in the literature that people start realizing, we, you know, it's, it's not about curing autism. It's actually how to sort of help individuals to cope with it, you know, that uh, we need to start doing. Yeah. I love it for sure again baby steps for sure and I really I'm 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 I I really am thinking it's it's interesting I'm doing a workshop on Friday and I wanted to go and redo it um, but I'm thinking how can we yes gather the information that we well and I don't even know that we typically gather but I love your levels and how can we think about being intentional about thinking about that and should that kind of intentional um or that should we not attend actively and um in a in a real way to that kind of um data as well as the kind of data that we we typically do so you've given me much to think about and I knew you would and I hope everyone else feels the same so um, so here's another comment coming in focus on performance at all cost is anxiety provoking for everyone involved not just the student yeah and I think that this approach has got a, a, a very different message for professionals too because uh, it it allows you to also be gentle on yourself as a, as a professional yes. and it's critical because that's what you're imposing on the people you work with. Right. So uh, by starting at home and realizing, you know, that personal engagement is what life is about and what living really is about, you know, um, and actually investing in being able to record it better and sort of um, measure the kind of things we feel should be measured, I think is pivotal. Lovely. I totally, totally, totally agree. Well, thank you ever so much for this wonderful talk to, as I say, launch us for the this year. Um, I did hear um, maybe that this was beginning of a conversation, so I may well take you up on that. We may invite you back. <laughs> um, and. Yeah. And I think one of the things that would be lovely for people in Alberta and, and is to take your book and do a, do a little book study. I mean, I think that would be a, a lovely thing to do. And that maybe would be great. And, you know, if I can have a couple of ideas and questions coming in before the time, yeah. I would be very, very open to that. That would be wonderful. That would be wonderful. Well, um, I think we will, we shall, we shall um, return and continue with this type of thinking and with this um, focus on meaning making. And um, I hope to hear from you that you, you know, I'll start a book club. That'd be great. Let's do it. And, um, and we'll invite Erna back to continue the dialogue with us. So again, thank you ever so much. And again, uh, coming in from the the uh, chat thank you so much very motivating and inspiring and i couldn't agree more so thank you thank, thank you. you okay
So good night, everyone. If there's other things that you want to say, this is your uh, chance. And uh, if not, um, I look forward to hearing from those of you who want to do the book club. And we will um, see you in October. And um, for this evening, go out and have a lovely, a lovely evening. And Erna, again, thank you so very much. Thank you. Good night. Good night.